We're going to look beginning in a few verses in the Gospels, so if you want to open up to Matthew chapter 3, we'll start there. We're going to talk about a phrase that's a very biblical phrase, but there's confusion about the meaning of the phrase and the church in general, I mean, speaking larger than our church, but the different churches that exist have different opinions. In fact, there's quite divergent views within the body of Christ on this particular topic, but I think it's a topic that uh, is very, very important, and it's worth your consideration and, and worth your energy to consider carefully what the Bible says about the subject. And we're going to be looking at something that was introduced by John the Baptist. He's the first person to really use this phrase the last prophet of the Old Testament, announcing the coming of the Messiah. And he contrasts the ministry of the Messiah with his ministry. He says they're very, very different. Uh, he came to, we are look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then also the judgment in verse 12, that his winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So John the Baptist wanted to make clear to the audience that he was not the Messiah and that his ministry was, was distinctly different than the, the Messiah's ministry that the best he could do was give people an opportunity to have an outward show of their repentance. His baptism was not like a Christian baptism. The Christian baptism, if you're baptized as a believer of Jesus, it's a picture of your death to the old nature, and then you're being raised up out of, a, out of the watery grave. The, the water is a symbol of the grave, and you're raised, and it's the new life that you have as a believer. You're born again. It's a death and a resurrection that it's a picture of. John the Baptist's baptism was not that. His baptism was a baptism of repentance, that you're turning from walking away from the Lord and you're turning towards the Lord. Remember, he's under the law. He's the last of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, in Mark chapter 1, verse 8, if you want to quickly turn over there, we'll just want to quickly look at all four of the Gospels' account of what John says. Mark chapter 1, verse eight, verses 7, 8, I guess. He said, he preached, saying there's one... Or there comes one after me who's mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So Matthew adds the phrase, and fire. Mark just says it very simply. I baptized you with water, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, and in verse 16, John answered, and said, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then turn to John chapter 1. All four Gospels record uh, John's testimony about the Messiah and about this particular aspect of the Messiah's ministry. John chapter 1 Verse 33, he said, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So all four Gospels record John's announcement that the Messiah will have a unique uh, ministry towards his disciples that John was not able to have with John's disciples. John said, I can baptize you uh, in water as a sign of your repentance, but the Messiah, when he comes, and he's mightier than I am, and I'm not worthy to stoop down and tie his shoes, if you will, if you use our, our vernacular, uh, he says, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then Luke and Matthew both add, and with fire. The Holy Spirit is going to be poured out, or whatever phrase you want to use the word. Baptism is a, is a very good word. Baptism is what you do with your Oreos and the milk, right? You know, the, some churches have tradition where they say the word baptism. Like, for example, the Catholic Church, they developed an unbiblical doctrine. It's not in the Bible. 
They developed the doctrine of original sin. You're born with that sin. That sin condemns you. You have to be baptized. Your parents bring you in. And as a little baby, you can't really fully immerse a little baby. That would be uh, too traumatic probably for the parents. The kid wouldn't remember it. But uh, he's not going to remember the sprinkling either. So that part doesn't matter. He's not a believer. He doesn't know. But the church is administering grace. The church is an administer of grace. And so they are giving a grace to the baby and a sprinkling of water. But there's a word in Greek for sprinkling, and it's never used. The word baptize, the Greek word for baptize, is the Greek word baptize. Now, why is that significant? Because when the translators came to the word that says immerse, baptism means immerse, they can't translate it as immerse because when they're translating it into English in the 1500s and then the King James in the early 1600s, they'd been sprinkling babies for centuries, and that kind of looks bad to have a church practice that you're not actually is not actually in the Bible. So just to make it so people don't understand, you just translate each letter. You take the beta and you turn it into a B, and you take the alpha and you turn it into an A, and you take the pi and you turn it into a P, you take the tau and you turn it into a T. So then you end up with a Greek word, baptizo, which means to dunk, to immerse something, to to completely engulf it. And so what John is saying is the Messiah, when he comes, he's going to make it so that his followers, his disciples, he's going to be able to do something in your life. You're going to be surrounded by the Holy Spirit. You could say whelmed. The, the, the English word whelmed. You're going to be overwhelmed. It's going to be the Spirit of God is just going to be all around you. You'll be immersed in the Holy Spirit. Just as you were immersed in water by me for repentance... He's going to do something in you that no human being could do. It's awesome. And Jesus used this term and promised his disciples that this was literal and that it would happen to them. Acts chapter 1, let's turn there now. So we went Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, now the very next book, the historical books of the New Testament, I guess not counting the book of Revelation. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 4. It says, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you've heard from me. John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus took the thing that John said, there's, standing one, there's one among you, he, I'm not worthy to... Uh, Unloose his sandal, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus is telling his disciples, that which John told you about, it's going to happen in a few days. Don't leave Jerusalem until it happens. Now he'd already commanded them, go into all the world and make disciples. Now he's telling them, yeah, you know what you're going to do, but don't do it yet. <laughs> you need something before you go do it. They're still not uh, totally understanding him because this event hasn't happened yet. They ask a question about the kingdom of Israel. Verse 6, when they were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? His answer, verse 7, was not, no, I'm not ever going to do that. His answer is, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. People have, until today, are still interested in when is this going to happen? <laughs> what about the end times? Is this guy the Antichrist? Is this going to be the final, whatever? But look at verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is Jesus describing the phrase, the baptism of the Spirit. When, the person, when a person experiences the baptism of the Spirit, it's going to fulfill Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, we talked about this last week. The Holy Spirit will be with you, Jesus told his disciples, or he's been with you, he will be in you, and now we have another preposition. He will come upon you. The Holy Spirit being in you is different than the Holy Spirit being upon you. Just as much as you said, I put milk in my Oreo cookie, or I put my Oreo cookie and I immersed it into the milk. Prepositions matter, right? You, you can't just make them mean something. Words matter. The words are used on purpose. And this is important for us to just let the Bible say what it says and just simply let it mean what it says. When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. 
you're, in a sense, you could say you're filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to live in you or you're not born again. You don't belong to God. It's the ownership. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. So to be a follower of Jesus, to have received Christ, is to have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. You don't get more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's in you. You're born again. The Spirit's in you. What Jesus is talking about here, what John the Baptist was announcing and foretelling, was exactly what Jesus describes in verse 8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you'll receive power. Power to do what? Power to be what? He says, you will see power to be my witnesses. You'll be witnesses to me. This is power to be a witness of Jesus. Supernatural power. Now, this phrase, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is a controversial phrase. If you came from a different church background like me, I went to a Bible college that believed that uh, there was no such thing as the baptism of the Spirit, that all the churches that believe in the gifts of the Spirit and, and, uh, and emphasize those things, that they're, all, that they're wrong and that uh, they're mistaken. Maybe they're sincere, but if they're sincere, they're mistaken. And so the churches, the churches have very different opinions. This is not an essential doctrine for your salvation. So you're not going to lose your salvation over what your view of the baptism of the Spirit is. It's not something worth fighting with your friends over. Neither is it worth your friends fighting with you over. So if you come to understand something from the Bible about what, and you have a friend who thinks you need to speak in tongues or you're not baptized in the Spirit, just smile at them and say, that's an interesting opinion. I don't hold that opinion but I'm glad that you do, so now that I don't have to. You know, someone already, I mean, I don't know, just avoid, there's, it's not worth arguing over. If someone has genuine questions and they say, well, why do you believe that? I don't, I don't, I've never met anybody who believes that. You say, well, here's why, you share it with them. But it, once it becomes argumentative, it, to me, it's just not worth it. This isn't something worth arguing over. That doesn't mean it's not very important. And I, I say this with great conviction because I got saved in a church that didn't believe in this. They didn't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness of Jesus. They did in some respect. They did believe that there was a Holy Spirit, and they did believe that God worked in people's lives. But we were not taught to expect the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I got a degree to learn how to be a minister, to be a minister in a church, and I was not taught to expect really the power of the Holy Spirit. I've made a joke, and I guess it's not totally a joke, but I Sometimes I've joked and I said, I got a degree in how to be a pastor if there was no Holy Spirit. And I, I mean, and I don't merely necessarily mean it joking. I think in a lot of ways, that's what my degree was in. Let's pretend God's not going to help us. So what would we do? And as much as if you went to school to get a business degree, they're not going to tell you in a business school to pray and ask God to bless your business, are they? They're not going to tell you, well, if you don't have enough sales, pray before you go out and if you're sending out your sales team out there, you ought to pray for favor and pray for open doors. And, you know, they're not going to teach you that. What are they going to teach you? You know, here's how you meet customers. You've got to find out what their needs are. You've got to ask them questions. You've got to, here's these techniques. Here's the closing techniques. And, and so there's a lot of, a, a, a part of the church that's not expecting the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be, you know, there's going to be a pressure to rely upon your own energy. At least that was my personal experience. And, uh, and so for me, I think that while I'm not willing to argue with anybody about this, I am willing to teach this with all my conviction that I have. I believe with all of my heart that Jesus still baptizes people with his Holy Spirit. He says, when he tells them about this in verse 4, he said, you've heard this from me. This is not the first time they've heard this. He's told them about this. This is a huge benefit or I would say a huge part of the relationship with God through his Messiah. The Messiah, John the Baptist, the last one in the Old Covenant to tell us about the Messiah, emphasized when he comes, he's going he's to pour out the Spirit on you in a way that you've never had it happen. And, and Jesus describes it here, you'll be witnesses unto me. When did they hear about this power? Jesus said, you've heard from me. Well, when did they hear about it? What verses can you think of? Well, here's one. John 14, verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. 
And in the context, he repeats, I'm going to the Father, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. If I don't go away, then the Spirit won't come. Put in the context in John chapter 14, 15, 16, he's talking about when I'm gone, you're going to do the things that I did and you're going to do even greater things than the things that I did. Well, Jesus did some great things. The dead were raised, the lepers were cleansed, the blind could see, the lame could walk. People heard the word of God with power. They were astonished at his teaching because it struck them. The, the officers that were sent to arrest him came and they were arrested, so to speak. They came back without him and they told the leaders, we never heard anyone speak like this man speaks. So the power of God working through the life of Jesus, Jesus told his disciples that same power you're going to see working through your lives. On, in John chapter 7, another passage that I think of, John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So if you're thirsty, your need, come and I will fill. You can drink from me and it will fill and quench your thirst. But then he says in verse 38, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, will flow rivers of living water. If you feel dried up, there's a place to go. My goodness, there's a place to go if you're dried up. If you came to church tonight and you said, man, I'm just dried up. I got to get to church on Wednesday night, man. I just need to get a, a refill. Hey, come to Jesus. Are you thirsty? Come and drink because he can quench your thirst. But if you're dried up and you say, Lord, I, there's not an outflow. I want an outflow coming out of my life. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, he doesn't say the apostles. Verse 38, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Whoever believes in me. If you're a believer in Jesus, you ought to expect torrents of rushing, living water coming out of your heart. It's coming right out of the deepest part of who you are. Your, your soul and your thirst so quenched but then turning around and flowing right out as this living water. And then John interprets it. Verse 39, John said this, he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. I'm not sure that he's speaking in this context necessarily only, or maybe even primarily, about the Spirit coming to live inside of us. Probably the first part. If you're thirsty, come to me and drink. The Spirit of God will come in and live inside of you. Make your heart His home. But when He says, rivers of living water flowing out of you, that's not the Spirit of God indwelling you. What is that? I think that's the phrase that John the Baptist foretold. You're going to be, you're going to be immersed in the Holy Spirit. You're going to be dunked. You're going to be overwhelmed. It'll be, the Spirit will be surrounding you. He'll come upon you. And John said, when Jesus was saying that out of his heart would flow rivers of living water, he was speaking about the Holy Spirit because those who believe in him would have this experience. This is not an experience that's only for the apostles. Some who believe in uh, these gifts, sometimes they say, well, yes, they happen. Look at the book of Acts. We see these things happening. But it ended with the apostles. These were gifts that were given, and once the church was started, once the ball got rolling and the church got started, that first generation had this power. But then after that, the Bible was given, and we have the Word of God, and we no longer have a need for these uh, supernatural gifts from God. And I would just say, uh, in the, when I read about the New Covenant, it's not like there's one part of the New Covenant for the apostles, and one, then the rest of us get the, the leftovers of the New Covenant, the kind of day-old covenant. It's new, but it's like they got the first fruits of it. In the, the new covenants, the new covenant, the promises of the new, where they're, hey, there's, God shows no partiality. The new covenant's the new covenant. If it's a new covenant promise, now not everyone's an apostle. We have the original apostles. They, are, they gave the word of God, the, that first group. They gave us the word. Yes, that's a unique thing. We don't, we're never going to have apostles like that. But beyond them, the power of the Holy Spirit's available. There isn't, there isn't any reason for me, in my mind, to think that this ended in the first century. And I think it's important that we define these terms. Randy and I uh, have talked a lot about this because he's had a lot of questions about this coming from another country and trying to sort through this in his own mind what he believes and how would you explain this. 
And, and uh, one of the things that I think he's observed, he's, and he, we've had this conversation a couple of times, he said, it just seems like it's the words that are used. And if you use certain words, people just think of that word as being sort of like, you can't, you know, like it just blows them up. They just can't think of it, you know, like, don't say the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's a, you know, we don't believe in that. Um, well, listen, look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Do you believe in that? <laughs> Do you want power to be a witness of Jesus? Well, guess what? Jesus will give it. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses unto me. There's nothing to be afraid of when it comes to the working of the Holy Spirit. He wants to glorify Jesus. We've already covered this a bit. He, he's going to take not of his own, but he's going to take what belongs to Christ and show us the things that are freely given to us by God. Uh, we're not afraid of him living inside of us. He's wonderful. He's the comforter. He's the helper. Why would I be afraid or worried about him coming upon me and giving me power to be a witness of Jesus? And part of the problem, I think, is some of the, the weird behaviors that sometimes take place. If you ever, maybe you grew up in a church or maybe you visited with a friend at church where everybody was speaking in tongues at the same time or there was all these kind of weird men and you just thought, what in the world is this? I don't even understand it. That's one of the reasons I think we have 1 Corinthians written for us, and we'll spend more time talking about the individual gifts and what they look like and what they mean in the following Bible studies. But uh, for tonight's sake, Paul spoke about, listen, if you're all speaking in tongues at the same time and somebody walks in who's new or they're not a believer, Paul says, they're going to think you're crazy. <laughs> and, he, and I almost like, and rightly so. Like He says, if you're going to speak in tongues, two or Three at the most, which to me implies maybe one, right? If there's going to be prophecy, not everybody's prophesying. You know, it needs to be orderly and decent. It needs to make sense to people. And so if you have a thing where everybody wants to do their own thing, that's not, that's not the nature of Jesus, everybody trying to do their own thing and fighting over, to get over the top of each other. That's, that's not Jesus' heart. That's not the fruit of the Spirit that we talked about last week. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It's consideration of others. Love is patient and it's kind. It doesn't seek its own. Boy, I've met people who were so mad at me because they didn't have a place in the congregation. They felt like to use their gift. And what they usually mean is, I wanted to stand up in the service and inflict all the people with the thing I like to do that makes me feel special. I want to be able to stand up and it makes me feel special. And I don't care how it makes everybody else feel, but I need to be able to do my thing. And if you, don't, you didn't let me do my thing... And my answer is always, like, yeah, you're not going to do your thing. <laughs> not here. And not to these people. Uh, we're not doing that. We don't, we don't believe in that. That's not the Lord. I don't, maybe it's a legitimate gift, but man, you need to grow spiritually so you can learn how to use it. And hey, listen, if you want to use your spiritual gifts, there's a whole bunch of people during the break that probably could have used a word of encouragement. I know, I'm looking around, I could have used one, you could have used one. I mean, what's your week been like? It's, we're coming to Christmas. You know, you've got a lot of stuff going on in your life. Would have been neat for someone to come up with a word of knowledge or a gift of exhortation or a gift of prophecy and say, you know what, I was walking by you and I think the Holy Spirit put this on my heart. And, I, and then you hear and you think, oh, thanks for sharing that. Man, that was so encouraging. You don't need to stand up in the service and go, oh, God, the Lord has put it on my heart. So that everybody knows you're a big shot. I'm, I'm serious. Uh, it's, it's, it's not right. It's not right. So you may have had an experience that makes you just think, you know, we have the old phrase, you throw the baby out with the bathwater. The bathwater is dirty, so you need to get rid of the bathwater. Please don't throw the baby out. Who would do such a thing? I've, we have five kids. We, I've thrown away a lot of bathwater. We never lost a kid yet. Tried a couple times, but they hold on to the <laughs> rim of the pails, you know. You're like, get, get, trying to get them out of there. You know, never lost a baby. Why? Because I'm keeping the baby. I'm just getting rid of the bathwater. When it comes to the power of the Holy Spirit, listen, Jesus wants to give you power so that you can be living proof. If you want, what does it mean to, wit, to be a witness? If they say, hey, there's a car wreck out here at, uh, at Harbor Point and, uh, and Laguna Boulevard. And, they, and then you were driving by and you were there and, they, and you stopped. You say, hey, I saw it all. And they say, all right, let's get your information. And then you get a note. You got to go to the court because they want you to testify. And you're going to do what? You're going to be living proof you're going to give a testimony. You're going to say, listen, I saw what happened. And you'll give your side of the... I was standing there. I saw this guy run the red light. He hit this guy, T-boned him. Man, I saw the whole thing. You're, you're, an, you're evidence, right? You're, 
So listen, do you want to be evidence that Jesus is alive? Isn't that your heart crying for that? Don't you want everybody around you to go, man, I wasn't sure I believed in God, but I spent five minutes with this person. I, there has to be a God. The way that God's working in their life, the way God answers their prayer, they seem to have insight, the, way, the compassion that they have, the way that they care about people, the way that they, they love people and interact with them, the, the, the time that they take with people. I was, I'm not sure I'm a believer, but I'm sure they are. <laughs> and I don't know what's going on in their life, but if, if I ever was interested, I'd want what they have. Don't you want that? That's what this is. Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be witnesses to me. It's awesome. Now, Peter also defines this term. Well, let's, let's start with a definition first before we go to Peter. In light of what we've read already, John the Baptist announced that what Jesus said about it, the baptism of the Spirit def defined um, what the Bible says about it, at least the two people who talk directly about it, John the Baptist and Jesus, I would define it as Jesus pouring out his spirit on his disciples so they'll be empowered to be his witnesses. That's what the baptism of the spirit is. Jesus pouring out his spirit onto his disciples so that they can be his witnesses. Jesus is the one doing the baptizing. John the Baptist said, I baptize you in water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one doing the baptizing. We are the ones who are being immersed and the Holy Spirit is what we're being immersed into. Or he's the one that's, Jesus is the immerser, he's the baptizer. We're the ones that are getting the baptism and the Spirit is what's baptized, you know, what we're being baptized into. He's immersing them in, with, and by the Holy Spirit. Now Peter defines it in the immediate context because they do experience this. And I guess we'll save some of this because we'll talk about these gifts. But Acts chapter 2 describes the Spirit coming upon them. They're, they're given abilities that they don't have naturally, and the people come around and they don't understand it, and they, they are confused. In verse 12, they say, what does this mean? And Peter stands up to give an explanation. Verse 14, Acts chapter 2, verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this uh, be known unto you and heed my words. These are not drunk, as you suppose. Some people were accusing them of being drunk since it's only the third hour of the day. And look at verse 16. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Why is that important? Because look back at Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of who? The Father. The Father promised this. The Father and the Son and the Spirit are all three present in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Father promised it. The Son brings it and does it, and the Spirit is the one that we experience this with. The promise of the Father. What promise of the Father? Well, Peter tells us which one. We don't have to go looking for it. Peter, when, he, when they're confused about it, Peter says, this is the promise. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Look at verse 17. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So it's not just going to be only men. It's going to be men and women that are going to be speaking the word of God. The young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. It won't just be the young people doing it, and the old people are retired. It won't just be the old people doing it, and the young people going, well, when I get old, I'll do it. Both old and young are going to have supernatural direction from God. The old will still be dreaming dreams. The young will be having visions Verse 18, on my men servants and on my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they'll prophesy. And then he goes on to talk about the supernatural signs that will ultimately come before the great and awesome day of the Lord. So Peter, when he is, has experienced, Jesus said, this is going to happen in a few days. Now it's a few days later, it's happened. And Peter has a chance to give an explanation, and he quotes a promise of the Father, I'll pour out my spirit. That's the explanation. Jesus said, you're going to receive a promise of the Father. Peter quotes a promise of the Father. This is that which Joel spoke about. And then in his sermon, when he is explaining this, and he's coming to his conclusion, look, jump down to verse 33. After he talks about the cross and the resurrection, then he says in verse 33, Therefore, 
being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now we're specifically talking about the promise. He poured out this which you now see and hear. What's the promise? It's the promise of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that you saw, that you heard, that you recognized. It's the promise of the Father that Joel talked about. We're experiencing it. Jesus is doing this. And then notice, just before, we'll come back and talk about this before we finish, but notice we're here. They respond. They say in verse 37, what should we do? Peter, verse 38, says, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But look at verse 39. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now, when we're reading the Bible, we want to pay attention to the context. Have we heard the word promise before? Yeah, we heard it in the sermon. We heard it back in verse 33. What's the promise there? Having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What promise is quoted in this sermon? The promise of Joel. That's the promise of the Father. Acts chapter 1, you're going to receive the promise of the Father. So if I'm just going to let the word promise in its context mean what it's been meaning, if you're talking about the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this promise, verse 39, is for you and your children and to all who are afar off, even in Elk Grove, as many as, that's far off. We're about as far off from Jerusalem as you could possibly be. I mean, almost all the way, exactly halfway around the earth. We could go a little, if you were somewhere in the Pacific, we'd be all the way. Maybe Hawaii's halfway. As, as many as the Lord our God will call. It's my opinion, and I, I believe this. I believe that this promise, this statement here, lets us know that the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for everybody, whoever wants it. You want it? Ask Jesus for it. He's the one who does it. Now, this, there's some confusion because there's another phrase, there's another place where something similar is said. Turn, turn in first, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I, I hope uh, to not totally confuse you right now, but it's important to, to recognize this because some people will quote this verse, or you might read it one day and see it and say, well, this is, is this the same thing? Uh, Paul's talking about the body of Christ, how we all have different gifts, and the Spirit divides the gifts amongst us, and we're like a body, verse 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. As the body is one and has many members. How many bodies do I have? One and a half? I mean, it's the holiday season. One and a, well, one and a, two? I mean, I don't know, what do you say? How, I have one body, but how many fingers do I have? Well, okay, I got ten fingers, but I got one body. How many legs do I got? I got two legs, but I got one body. How many eyes? I got two eyes, but one body, right? We're one body, but we're many members. He's talking about the body of Christ. We're one body, but how many anetiers do we have? We just got one, right? How many patties do we have? We just have one. Well, we have a couple patties. <laughs> how many patty Knowltons do we have? I mean, right, like, we might, have, we might have many members, but we're only one body. We might be one body, but we have many members. He says, the body is one, has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so is Christ. And look at verse 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we've been all made to drink into one spirit. In fact, the body is not one member, but many. He goes on to talk about the body. So in the context, what are we talking about? The body is one, many parts, but just one. And then he uses a phrase. He says, did you recognize it? Verse 13, by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. So I've had people say to me, when, you, when I'm teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they say, well, wait a minute. And Paul says, we're all baptized by one spirit into the body. Well, let me ask you some questions. In Acts chapter 1, who's baptizing? Jesus. Who's being baptized? The believers. What are we being baptized into? The Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one we're being immersed into. We're being immersed by the, or with Jesus doing the immersing, but the Spirit is the one that we're immersed into. Look at verse 13. Who's baptizing? By one Spirit, we are all baptized. So who's baptizing? The Spirit. Who's being baptized? Believers again. What are the believers being baptized into? 
By one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. We're being baptized into the body of Christ. You can't make yourself part of the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit has to. <laughs> it's supernatural. It's, that's an amazing thing. Also, the body of Christ may not want you. Okay? This, Saul of Tarsus had that experience. The body of Christ did not want Saul of Tarsus to be part of the body of Christ. But the Holy Spirit, he baptizes you into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit, he makes you the body. He immerses you into the body. You, you become part of the body by the work of the Holy Spirit. Is that the same thing? If you compare them, Jesus is the baptizer, Holy Spirit's the baptizer. That's different. Believers are being baptized. That's the same. Jesus baptizing believers with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit baptizing believers into the body of Christ. That's not the same thing. This is not talking about what Acts chapter 1 is talking about. The confusion comes is if I say the baptism of the Spirit. Maybe the best thing you should say is, well, which one? You know, if somebody asks you, do you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You might just say, which one are you talking about? Because I've experienced two. I've been baptized by Jesus with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's come upon me, and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and I've got the gifts of the Spirit, and I'm a witness of Jesus. I've got the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness of Jesus. And guess what? I've also got the baptism of the Spirit. I've been baptized in the body of Christ. They didn't want me, but they got me. <laughs> they can't get rid of me. The Holy Spirit, he made me part of the body. Awesome. It's not the same thing. The words do mean something, and uh, anyway, it's important. So let's go back to Acts chapter 1, because I want, I want to be able to really, I want to encourage you. My goal tonight is to encourage you to expect God to work in your life and to receive this promise. Who is this promise for? We've already talked about this. It's a promise of the Father in chapter 1, verse 4 of Acts. It's which promise? It's Acts chapter 2, verse 16. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Who's this promise for? Acts chapter 2, verse 39. This promise is for you and for your children. Which promise are we talking about? Acts chapter 2, verse, 40, verse 33. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out that which you now see and hear. I believe that what John the Baptist was talking about was a new covenant reality that the Messiah will bring about and that will be possible for as many as the Lord our God shall call. It's not just for missionaries, pioneer missionaries, people taking the gospel into the first time it's ever gone into an area and they're going to have... They're going to have supernatural powers to do certain things just because the gospel's never gone there before. But once it gets settled, we don't need the power of the Holy Spirit. That, that might be historically true, or I should say, that might be historically accurate because of our human nature. We begin in the Spirit, but then we seek to be made perfect by the flesh. Paul warns the Galatians, are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you not going to be made perfect in the flesh? Just because our tragic experience in church history is we begin in the Spirit, and then when we kind of get it organized, we sort of wave goodbye to God and say, we'll take it from here. Uh, generally, when people are desperate and they're trusting the Lord and looking to the Lord, they're going to be open, the Lord's going to work, and they're walking by faith and in humility, and they're seeking the Lord, and they experience this wonderful work of God. And then, like so many of the kings that we'll be looking at this week and into the next few weeks as we get into 2 Kings, until he became strong, we'll read about one of the kings. And when he became strong, then he fell. This, is, this promise, it might be historically, tragically accurate that, uh, yeah, it was there, but then you, know, you saw less of it. Well, that's sad. <laughs> because I believe the Bible tells us the promise is for as many as the Lord our God will call. So what can we expect? What will you expect? If you... If you say, Lord, I want this. I'm not sure I've had this. I'm not sure I've been filled with the Holy Spirit like this. I know I've accepted Christ. I know it lives inside of me, but I really want to have power to be a witness. And so you're going to, tonight, you're going to say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Baptize me with your Holy Spirit, Jesus. I want everything you have for me. What can you expect? Well, we're not going to require you to get a special haircut. You're not going to have to wear a man bun. I hope that I don't see any man buns. Any man buns present? I don't mean to pick on anybody. Uh, I just thought of man bun. You know, like a ponytail coming out of the top of your head or finger symbols or have to wear weird clothes. 
What can you expect? You can expect exactly what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Power. Supernatural power. Power to be a witness of Jesus. And, and we'll talk about this. Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. We'll begin to cover that starting next week. We're going to go through the list of gifts that are in 1 Corinthians and also in Romans. There's an example in the book of Acts of every single spiritual gift that's mentioned by the Apostle Paul. Every, and Peter mentioned some gifts. You can find in the book of Acts an example of every single gift mentioned in the letters. We'll go through them all, but you can expect spiritual gifts. Abilities to do, the ability to do things you would not naturally be able to do. If you are super fast and super athletic, we probably wouldn't be surprised to watch you dunk a basketball because you see how athletic you are. But if I was dunking a basketball, you'd be surprised. You say, whoa, whoa, where's the trampoline? What, hey, how'd you do? Like, what is that? But, you know, if I was 6'6", six, six, and I weighed, you know, 205 pounds, zero body fat, I'm just, and you just watch, you watch me leaping, you're like, man, well, that's not a big, that's his natural ability. This is supernatural ability. It's not natural. It's unnatural. <laughs> Extra natural. It's the ability to do something you're not able to do. And that causes someone to recognize that Jesus is alive from the dead. You're a witness of Jesus. They're God-given. They're gifts. They're called gifts. That means uh, they're just given to you. They're not based upon maturity. That's why if you're a new Christian, you need to pray and ask God to baptize you with His Holy Spirit. Ask Jesus to baptize you with His Holy Spirit because these are just gifts. They operate in your life. They're not based on maturity. In fact, this is one of the lessons you need to learn. You can see a person who's using these wonderful and amazing gifts, and they're actually an obnoxious person that needs to grow spiritually. The spiritual gifts will be present and will be used mightily in a person who actually might be backslidden. They're not based on maturity. They're gifted. They're, they're not earned. They're not learned. This is not something you can go to school and I went to healing school, and I learned how to heal. I went to discerning spirits school. They taught me how to discern spirits. Some of the things can be learned. You can learn about healing, how the body heals itself, what to do to help the body facilitate the healing. Use an ice pack, rest, ice, compression, elevate, right? You go through that, you know, that's going to make it better. But if someone walks over and goes, Lord, I just pray in the name of Jesus, you heal his knee, and they lay hands on the person, and boom, they're better. There's no school for that. That's the Lord. Or a word of knowledge. You can't go to word of knowledge school. Okay, here's what you do. Just think really hard and try to imagine the secret that's in the person's heart. Just imagine Jane's secret. Oh my goodness, Jane, I can't believe. And I think I got it. Is it this? No, okay, am I getting warmer? Now you're just a mentalist. Now it's just a, it's just a sideshow, isn't it? It's not a sideshow. Or the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, I need you to go talk to this person and tell them this. And you think, oh, man. And you just go for it. You just obey the Lord. And you say, I don't know if the Lord put this on my heart, but I don't know. You, you, you be the judge. But I think, I think I, he wanted me to come and just share this with you. And you share it with the person. You don't walk over there and go, thus saith the Lord. I am, I am your discipler. And, and as your discipler, I am the one who speaks truth into your life. No, that's, that's, there's a bunch of weird drama junk that gets added. We don't want any of that, but we want the gifts. We, we're, we're open to them. So you can expect spiritual gifts, supernatural, God-given, not earned, not learned, not based on maturity, just power to do what God wants you to do in any moment. Isn't that exciting? Anything God wants to do, He could do through you. And you don't, you don't, you're going to have to even be ready for it. He could just drop it on you. It's the ability to do something you couldn't do naturally. We already read that verse in John 14, verse 12. The works that I do, you will do also, and greater works than these you will do because I go to the Father. So what kind of works should you be looking for? Things that Jesus did, and even things that Jesus never did. You know, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not looking for those. Well, you sh I should. I should be looking. I should be expecting that. One of them, I think, that we'll see that to be a witness is boldness. Here's something, that, especially for you that aren't bold. Pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. We see this operating in Acts chapter 4. 
after the lame man was healed and they brought Peter and John in after they'd been in jail and then they got out of jail and then they were brought back in and, and, then, and then they said, look it, tell us what name. And then Peter got up and he just totally laid a witness on these guys and it says this, Acts 4.13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they, they saw their boldness. I think that's a mark of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to be a naturally bold person. You don't have to be naturally outgoing. I'm looking around, I see quite a few fairly shy people, which I don't discriminate against shy people, being one myself. I have no interest in drawing attention to myself. I have much rather not have any attention drawn to me. Power of the Holy Spirit to have a, a, a supernatural boldness, to get outside of my natural comfort zone, of my own natural inclination, a boldness. If you don't have boldness, ask God for it. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power. Peter had that boldness. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he spoke to them. Another mark, I think, is clarity. There's a couple of verses. Colossians 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, praying for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. And he says this, that I, might, that I may make it manifest or clearly revealed as I ought to speak. He says, pray for me that I'll have an open door and pray that as I have that open door, I'll be able to speak clearly. I think a mark of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is great clarity in, in being able to share something with somebody related to Jesus, especially the gospel, but I think even if it's one of the other spiritual gifts that are spoken. Paul said this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 about the clarity in verses 1 through 5. He says, I, brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. And here's something for clarity. He says, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you with, in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. It's interesting that in the context, he's talking about clarity. He's not really talking about spiritual gifts here. I determined to be so simple in my message, just Jesus Christ and him crucified, and so my preaching was not in demonstration of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. One of the, if you want to have a, if you want to, uh, have a perfect example from the 20th century, go online and, uh, and just Google, go to YouTube and Google Billy Graham Crusade and watch, watch Billy Graham preach the gospel. And you'll see the baptism of the Holy Spirit present and God helping someone make the message clear. Such clarity. It says, it's, well, when he would share the gospel, the whole audience, it's like they're hearing the gospel and, the, and God just, he just pulled away everything. The message is just so simple. If you want to have clarity, ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Boldness, clarity, and then of course, I think supernaturally, uh, Paul said this about his own ministry in Romans 15, verses 17 through 19. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus and the things that belong to God, I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me, in word and in deed, to make the Gentiles obedient. And then he says this, in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. Signs and wonders. The apostles healed people. There, were, there was manifestations of the power of the Holy Spirit in word and in deed. How did the Holy Spirit manifest in the word? The power of the Word of God. We've already talked about it. The power of the Spirit working through the Word of God. But also, I think the clarity, the boldness coming with the Word. And then in actions, with mighty signs and wonders. Hebrews 2.4 says this, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to His own will. So, we should be living our lives as though what John the Baptist said was true. There stands one among you. He's mightier than I. I'm not worthy to unloose his sandal. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said to his disciples, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You've heard this from me, the promise of the Father. And Peter got up and said, this thing that we just experienced, that's what Joel promised. That's what God promised us. 
And we've experienced it, and it's been poured out on us, and the promise is for you and for your children and for those who are far off and as many as the Lord our God will call. And then we see the examples of it through the rest of the book of Acts. We have teaching on it in the letters of the apostles. The baptism of the Spirit is to give you power to be a witness of Jesus in boldness and in clarity and in supernatural ability and even in signs and wonders. Doesn't sound too scary. Now, you might say, well, I want to speak in tongues next week during the sermon. No. (laughs) Why? Why would we say that? Paul says, don't forbid to speak in tongues, but he gives rules. He says, unless there's an interpreter. And even with interpretation, he says, two, at the most, three. And he says, especially if there's an unbeliever present, then you shouldn't do it at all because the unbeliever is going to think you're cuckoo. Right? I mean, they're, they're, everything's, they're, everything's done in order. The gift of tongues is not for that. It's for something else. And we'll talk about that when we get to tongues. So the baptism of the Spirit. Now, you might say, well, I'm not sure I have that. Well, here's how you can get it. Who does the baptizing? Jesus. Who gets the baptism? The believer. And what is it? You're baptized in, the, you know, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, okay? So who does the baptizing? Jesus. So if you want it, who do you need to talk to? Talk to me for 100 bucks. I'll give it to you. No, that, the, the guy tries to do that in the book of Acts, right? In the book of Acts, there's a witch doctor who sees the apostles lay hands on people, and he comes up to him and he goes, how much money do I have to give you so you can give me that thing? What you guys just did, I could make a fortune. Can you show me how you did that? I'll buy that trick off of you, and then I can do it to people. If you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you want that, just ask Jesus right now. You can ask him right now. You don't have to wait. So just I'll give you a moment of silence before we close. If you want to ask him, just say, Jesus, please baptize me with your Holy Spirit. I want every gift you want me to have. I want boldness and I want clarity. I want whatever kind of power you want to put into my life because I want everybody to know you. Just ask him for it. Father, we thank you that you do give good gifts to your children, that you said that we can ask anything in your name. We could ask the Father in your name and he would do it. This is a promise of the Father that we're asking about. The Father said he would pour out his spirit on young men and old men and boys and girls, men and women, that you would pour it out on all flesh. So, Lord, John the Baptist said you would baptize us with your Holy Spirit. You told your disciples they would receive it. They told us it was for everybody. So we're asking you, Jesus, to pour out your Spirit upon us. Fill us, Lord. Fill us to overflowing. Jesus, baptize us with your Holy Spirit. We receive him. We receive his power, Lord. We receive that power from on high. And Lord, we we look for you to use us now to be witnesses of you. We pray these things in in your name, Jesus. Amen.